All right. Well, thanks, Julia, for the introduction. Uh, thank all you guys for coming. It's nice to have an audience for this. Um, and also to Andrew and Mark and the other organizers, thanks for putting this group on. I moved to Salt Lake about a year ago from Washington State and have been coming to this group since then. Uh, one of the talks I've enjoyed the most was the guy who got up and talked about consulting. That was a great talk. Uh, one of the things he said was a lot of people have this sort of idea that I'm an expert in this field and I use R, but I'm not a programmer, so I'm never going to be, you know, this good or whatever. And that's kind of how I feel about a lot of this stuff. So it was kind of nice to have him put a voice to that. And one of his uh, suggestions for the topic is if you want to kind of further your progression, he suggested, you know, if you're a regular attendee, try to present at one of these. So that was kind of my inspiration for getting up here. And, uh, you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity. So. Let's unpack this title, Geospatial Applications of R at USDA. First, let's talk about the USDA. Um, I've worked for the USDA for the last 10 years. If you see up in our little letterhead up there, about a year ago, they created a new mission area called FPAC, Farm Production and Conservation. What that is, is it's a combination of three existing agencies within USDA, the Farm Service Agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the Risk Management Agency. And also they created a new agency called the Business Center, which is supposed to be sort of the support for the other three agencies. I worked for NRCS for nine years and joined the Business Center about a year ago. And that's sort of how this talk's going to be divided up. We're going to talk a little bit about what NRCS does with R, and then we're going to get into what we're doing currently with the FPAC Business Center. So then for the geospatial applications, um, any data that has an XY coordinate and you can put on app is geospatial data. It could be points, it could be polygons, it could be you know raster data sets. There's a huge variety of stuff. Um, you know GPS is super common. GIS is a really common thing in this field. It's called geographic information systems. If you've seen Google Earth, that's sort of the idea. You've got different layers you can toggle on and off. The main difference being um, you know GIS is like Google Earth on steroids. There's a huge database component underneath that which enables a lot of analysis stuff. So GIS, uh, another huge data source is remotely sensed data, whether it's through aerial stuff mounted on planes or satellite stuff that's orbiting the planet. Uh, there's tons of different sources, types, flavors, varieties, um, and all of this kind of fits into R. So that's what we're going to talk about. But before we get you know, up into the stars in the clouds, I want to bring it back to the dirt. Uh, this is a picture of me with my head in a hole. This is in the North Cascades in Washington. So when I was with NRCS, we were doing soil mapping at North Cascades, Mount Rainier, and Olympic National Parks. Um, here's a large, heavy shovel that I got to carry around for a long time. Um, you know, being a, being a geographer, I'm always concerned about location. So this is about six miles hiking off the road and then another six miles up a random valley with no trail. Uh, we would do six months of this all summer, go out for eight days at a time, uh, live in a tent, dig holes all day. It's a lot of fun work. Um, this is kind of what we're getting at. These are some of the profiles we're looking at. Over here on the left is something called a spodosol. There's some really interesting iron chemistry going on, and that's how you get that bleached layer. Over here, this is an andesol, a soil that's really rich in volcanic ash from Mount Rainier. Uh, this orange layer is when Crater Lake was created, Mount Mazama erupted and deposited that. And uh, this is a Mount St. Helens ash layer. And just for reference, the 1980 eruption, sometimes you'll see it way up at the surface. It's about a centimeter thick. Um, so we're here to talk about R, not about dirt. I could talk about this forever. I spent a big part of my life doing this. Um, if you have other questions, get at me. But I kind of wanted to give a background. So. I got my undergraduate in soil science from Cal Poly. At the time when I started, I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, I took a class, I got into it, and stayed into it. 
I went to grad school at Washington State. Uh, my research was on digital soil mapping, doing this. Um, and then that transferred into my job at NRCS. So I was with NRCS for nine years, and there was really not much going on in terms of me and our studio. I wasn't using it very much. But sort of towards the end of that period, I took a training called Statistics for Soil Survey. It was the first time they offered it. It relied heavily on R. And it was kind of like this light bulb moment where I found you know, the, the other people who do that kind of stuff within the agency. And it turns out they're way better at it than I am. And there's a lot of great information there. Uh, so it was kind of this major awakening where I saw you know, all these different things that we're doing in different softwares can all be done through R together and really leverage the analytical capacity of R. Um, and I mean, if you really think about it, your computer programming for statistics for dirt, it's the nerdiest thing I can think of. <laughs> all right, so let's get into some of the geospatial stuff. Um, there's some important packages in R that really turn your R from a calculator into a GIS. Um, SP, raster, RGDAL are some important ones. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the data frame. The idea with the SP package and the spatial data frame is if you have an X and Y column in your data frame, you can promote that into a spatial points data frame, a different kind of R object that now has geographic coordinates and you can plot it on a map. Um, so some more background on geographic data sources. There's really two main types, raster and vector data. Uh, vector data is points, lines, and polygons. It's kind of what we see here. You've got your points. You know, those could be GPS locations where a sample was taken. And then you've got your polygon, which is maybe a soil boundary or something like that. And then the other version is raster, which is sort of grid-based. So you can think of an XY coordinate system where every cell has a value. That could be some reflectance in the case of imagery. It could be elevation for you know, DEMs. Uh, it could be climate. You know, there's really a wide variety of different data types out there. Um, so GDAL is a really important package. It's the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. In R, it's called RGDAL. Um, that's sort of the key that unlocks all of this, because you can have a column of x and y but without some sort of coordinate reference system, are those lat long? Is that meters? Is that feet? What kind of coordinate system are you using? And GDAL is sort of the key to unlock that and you know, put your data on a map. All right. So back into the soils world a little bit more. There's something called NASIS, the National Soils Information System. And on the left is the database schema for NASIS. It is very unwieldy. It's not easy to visualize your data. I had a coworker named Chuck who was getting pretty close to retirement. And he said, if you make me do NASIS, I'm going to retire. So Chuck never had to do NASIS. But every other soil scientist in the country does. Uh, this is a great graph. It shows you the number of point observations in NASIS. It's about 700,000. So this is a massive database, and it's very complex. So two general flavors here. There's point data, like I was showing you with those soil profiles. That's you know, an observation at a given location that includes your site information, plants, you know, landforms, and then everything you see underground, the different horizons and all those properties. But if you look at a soil map, you're not looking at point observations. You're looking at polygon data. So there's a step in there where you aggregate your point data into components, data map units, map units, and legends. So that's sort of a real quick version of how this works. And it's stored in NASIS in all these interrelated tables, and they have several you know, child tables, and it gets very complicated. So when I got plugged into the NRCS R community, I found out about two of these soil-specific packages. One of them is called SoilDB. The other is AQP, Analysis for Quantitative Pedology. Um, a guy named Jay Scovlin in Montana did a lot of work on that one, and Dylan Boudet in California did the other one. Um, what these allow you to do is use this fetch NASIS function to go dig into this huge, ugly database and pull out really useful stuff. So here's some more things you can do with this fetch NASIS function. Um, I don't expect anyone to know what any of these things are, but 
they are existing soils databases that are not really linked, at least they weren't previously. So you can pull in you know, data from the OSD server or from the soil data access. Uh, SCAN is a network of weather stations. You can pull in data directly from them. KSSL is the national laboratory where they do a bunch of lab testing. Um, rapid carbon assessment was something NRCS did recently to try and get at soil carbon content. The idea here is you can pull all of these disparate data sources together through a fetch NASIS command and start analyzing it in R. Um, I can't tell you how powerful that is. That is something that was sort of unheard of until about five years ago. And I think it's really going to change the way NRCS approaches soil mapping. So this is another great figure. Um, you've got three sort of end members here. You've got your database stuff. So SQL, um, NASIS, the example I was showing. On the other side, you've got your geoprocessing, your you know, true GIS software. ArcGIS is from Esri. That's sort of the industry standard. Uh, ERDAS does a lot of image processing. And you get up to the top to the more analysis kind of thing. And this is where R really shines because it's sort of the bridge between all of these different things. Um, we mentioned the GDAO package. That allows you to turn your R into a pretty advanced GIS. And then another package, RODBC, is open database connections. And that's what allows you to link your R and your NASIS client. Um, really powerful there. So another great application of R, it's gotten so popular now that even the people at Esri who make ArcGIS realize, hey, people are doing this. So they've built an R bridge where you can build functions in R and then execute them through an ArcGIS platform. So that's pretty nice. Um, OK, this is sort of the crux of a lot of digital soil mapping, soil mapping, and I'd go as far to say sort of environmental modeling in general. This is something that's very hard to observe. Digging this hole is not fun. I can guarantee that. I was walking around this site for a couple minutes just knowing it was going to be like that. And my coworkers are like, what are you doing? I'm like, ah, I'll just start. And it ended up being that much fun. But the idea is you take something that's hard to observe and you want to correlate it with something that's easier to observe. You know, the remote sensing data, satellites are up there collecting data 24 seven. I don't have to go out and pound the ground for an hour. So if you can build a correlation between, you know, known quantities that are harder to observe and environmental factors that are relatively easy to observe, it'll allow you to apply that over large geographic areas. So that's sort of the gist of a lot of environmental modeling. And now this is where R comes into that. It really allows you to take a quantitative approach to building those relationships. So here's some of the graphical outputs you can do with those different fetch commands and stuff in R. The one on the left is a soil texture diagram, uh, sand, silt, and clay, different particle sizes, how those combine will give you a soil texture. You know, there's clay, loam, sandy loam, etc. cetera. Um, typically, people haven't done that in the past. It's hard to plot all of that, especially if you're looking at hundreds of pedons, each with five or six different horizons. Um, R makes it super easy. It's a really nice feature. There's a package called Texture just for plotting things in a texture diagram. Uh, here you're looking at clay content and horizon depth for different horizon names. Um, part of mapping soils is you, you know, go out and look at a bunch of points and then aggregate that data. So this is a great way to kind of visually see that, think about what your range and characteristics should be, you know, how far can you deviate from your central concept before you're into a different soil. And then this one, this is definitely my favorite one here. In NASIS, this information is stored in five or six different tables and subtables, and you've got to drill down. Here, you can bring it into R, make one plot that has horizons, depth, color, you know, pet on ID, all kinds of stuff. In this example, they applied some regex pattern matching to pull out lithic soils. These are soils that have bedrock contact in them. That's these R horizons. Um, the, you know, this is where R shines. It's limitless in what you can do with visualization and analysis. So that's really sort of a revolution in soil science. Um, a central part of this is something called the soil profile collection. 
it's a R object that you get by running those fetch commands. And it takes a bunch of that NASA's data structure and kind of compresses it and flattens it into something that's easier to work with. Uh, the soil profile collections have seven slots. So you'll have one for coordinates, protection, bounding box. You'll have your site level data, your horizon level data, a bunch of other soil information. But it's super useful because now you can plot these things on a map, see where all your points are. You can, you know, dig into the soil profile graphs, start, in, you know, looking at the analysis stuff. Really powerful there. All right, so this kind of wraps up the soils portion of our talk. This is one of my favorite cartoons from the far side. Gary Larson, a Washington State alumni. Uh, this is Ditch Digger School. Everyone's got their trench except for Raymond over here. His is a little squiggly and the professor's yelling at him. Uh, one of the reasons I love this so much, when I was getting ready to go off to college, my parents asked me, what do you want to do with your life? And dead serious, I said, I want to live in the woods. <laughs> and then they reply, well, you have to make money. You can't dig ditches for the rest of your life. You know, here I am 20 years later, having spent a good portion of that time living in the woods, digging ditches. <laughs> so with that, we're going to transition into some of the work we're doing now at APFO. APFO is the Aerial Photography Field Office. We're a block over on State Street at the Federal Building. Um, APFO is a huge film vault for every aerial photograph the USDA has taken in the last 70 years. There's tons of this stuff. There's so much of it. It's really impressive. Um, and that's what we do. I've got some colleagues here, Quinn, Jerry, Greg, and Doug. Thanks for coming out today. Um, so let's talk about what we're doing at APFO and the LCAT project. So the land change analysis tool, or LCAT, is what we've been working on a lot. It's really taken off in the past year. So the image you see here is a NAEP photograph. It's the National Agricultural Imagery Program. And if this works, I'm going to try to give you a brief um, look at what this stuff is. Okay. So here is NAEP. Uh, they fly the whole country every two years. It's at one meter spatial resolution. This has been going on since about 2002. Um, you can see we've got national coverage. If we drill down, you can see Salt Lake. And you know here we are down at Newmont. So it's pretty good. It's high resolution imagery. If you've seen Google Maps, you've probably seen this before. So another portion of this that we need to talk about is that blue boundary. That's something called a common land unit or a CLU. This is something that USDA uses to delineate field boundaries. And if a farmer enrolls in some farm bill program, USDA wants to know, you know, how big is your field? What's in it? Um, that's how they determine acreage calculations and payment rates. So in this example, we're looking at a CLU from Georgia that according to the CLU database is classified as cropland. This is pretty obviously not the case here. So this is technically out of compliance with existing guidance. And that's what we're trying to target with our LCAP project. So this has been a partnership between FSA and the APFO. Really picked up steam about a year ago. And this is sort of the central idea. We're trying to streamline CLU compliance. Um, there are 38 million CLUs across the country and about 6,400 people who are tasked with all the review and maintenance of those records. You know, at USDA, the focus is definitely on customer service. So if you've got an employee in a county office and they've got a lineup of farmers out the door trying to sign up for some program, they're not going to turn them away so they can work on CLU compliance. This is something that really kind of falls to the wayside too often and has been ignored. So our project is going to try and reduce some of these maybe improper payments and save the county office time by improving the accuracy of these CLU records through an automated method. That's the general gist of our project. So in order to do that, we're going to do some land cover mapping. Um, 
NAEP is a huge investment, something that APFO is very invested in. If we can pull land form or land cover information out of that NAEP imagery, we're adding value to our product. Um, again, the CLU data maintenance is something that needs more attention. And we're trying to present this as an alternative to existing national land cover. So here's the existing standard. Um, there's something called the OMB A16 circular in which the government defines agencies who are in charge of certain geographic data sets. NRCS is in charge of soils. USGS is in charge of geology. Land cover is split between Forest Service and USGS. And this is their product. It's called the National Land Cover Database. Uh, this comes out every five years. It's based on satellite data from the Landsat satellites. So it like, has a 30 meter spatial resolution. And then there's a bunch of different land cover classes, forest, water, grass, shrub, barren, etc. Uh, this program began in 1992 and it's free. You can go download this from their website. Um, 2016 now available, that came out in the spring of 2019. So that gives you an idea of the lag time for them to acquire the imagery, pre-process it, do the classification, and then publish. So there's definitely um, a lot of time that goes into this. So for our needs, this doesn't really meet what we're looking for. Um, the five-year temporal resolution is not enough. If a farmer gets paid every year, we need more information than every five years. Uh, also for small farms, if you have you know, a one acre parcel, a 30 meter pixel doesn't really help you very much. And then there's some inherent differences between satellite and aerial photography stuff that kind of feeds into this. But ultimately we're realizing that's not meeting our needs. So that, that's where we come in with this new land cover mapping process. So the LCAP mapping method kind of broken out into four phases here. You come up with your game plan, do the training, do the mapping, and then evaluate it, see how good it is. So here are those same steps in a little more detail. Uh, the first two are in the planning phase. The next three would be in the training phase. Six and seven are the mapping, and then the last two are the evaluation. So let's dive into these, and we'll start with the planning phase. So we start with a NAEP DOQQ. That stands for Digital Ortho Quarter Quad. Uh, digital because these aren't film images, it's all digital camera now. Ortho, if you look at an image from an airplane, the point directly below the sensor is going to be in focus. And as you move away from that point, you're going to get distortion in the image. What ortho photography is, is you take a series of photos with overlap and then ortho rectify them so that every point in the image is as if you were looking straight down. You've taken out that distortion. The reason that's so useful is it allows you to make measurements based off the photo. And then QQ is quarter quad. USGS makes topographic maps of the country. Those are seven and a half minute quads. Uh, we cut those into quarters because the file size is pretty large. So these are four band images with one meter resolution and we'll look at one of them in the next slide. Four bands, we have uh, different wavelengths that the sensor's looking at. So there's red, green, blue, and near infrared. All right, so here's an example of one of these from Alabama. Uh, this was acquired October 2017. Interesting thing to note about this, there are 50 million pixels in an image for each band. And there's four bands, so there's 200 million pixels in this image. And to cover the country, there's 220,000 of these. So this is definitely big data. Um, this gets flown every two years. So depending on what state you're in, you're usually an even year or an odd year. Alabama's an odd year. And you can see different land use, uh, land cover types in the image. Forestry, uh, plowed fields, cropland, water, urban roads, stuff like that. So once we get these images, the next step is to calculate something called NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index with this formula here. Um, this is a really great index for targeting vegetation. If you have healthy growing vegetation, you're going to get a positive value. 
If you're a bare soil, you'd probably be closer to zero. And something like water or pavement is going to have a strong negative value. It's normalized from one to negative one. So we create this NDVI layer, take it back into our image, and use that for training. Um, this is really why NDVI works. If you look at these reflectance properties at different wavelengths for soil and vegetation, vegetation has a huge spike in between red and near infrared. So by targeting those differences with these band ratios, we can pull out that information. So here's what this looks like from our sample quad. The forested areas here are going to have the highest values, you know, close to zero in these plowed fields. And then up at the top there, you can see a water body that uh, has a very strong negative value. So my coworker from Georgia calls this the Jesus cows. Because if you were, you know, in, G in Geneva County, there's 16,000 CLUs. And there's one person who has to review all of those every time new imagery comes out. If you were looking through 16,000 of these, you might gloss over that and say, oh, it's green, it looks like grass, move on. But if you look at the NDVI values, you see that it's definitely not grass. You see a big difference there, and it can pick out that water. Okay, so at this point in the process, we're ready for training. We're gonna do that with something called condition Latin hypercube sampling. Has anyone heard of that before? Okay. Uh, we will get into that in a little more detail. So we use NAEP plus NDVI into CLHS to generate our sample points. Uh, these guys, Alex McBratney and Pierre Rudier, developed this algorithm. Uh, Pierre wrote the R package, it's called CLHS. It's not on CRAN, but you can get it through his GitHub site. Um, we take that and generate 100 points for each quarter quad. And you know, if we do a whole county, there'll be thousands of points in there. We just kicked off Idaho yesterday, and it's gonna be about 57,000 points. We're using NRCS's major land resource areas to stratify our training. And we'll get into that a little bit further on. So here's CLHS. The general idea here is that it's a stratified random sampling, but it doesn't focus on geographic space. It focuses on attribute space. So instead of going out and doing a grid pattern where I'm gonna sample every five feet, what it does is it puts down, you know, you could think of a bin of 100 points for each one of these um, distributions, right? For all these histograms, let's say I'm gonna look at the red values, cut it up into 100 bins, and put a point in each one. And it's doing that in this five-dimensional attribute space. Um, it's a pretty nice algorithm, and it's a great way to do sampling you can reduce the number of points you need to accurately describe the variability in an image. So here's the MLRA map of the country. The idea with these major land resource areas is that they're supposed to be homogeneous areas. You've got the same geology, soils, vegetation, land use, agricultural activities, and importantly for us, land cover. So this is one way we use to sort of nibble at this problem from a smaller perspective than trying to tackle you know, the country or a state at a time. So here it is in the southeast. You can see in the red is kind of the southern edge of the Appalachians. Then you get into the Piedmont and coastal plain, and then the coastal lowlands. So we use that to stratify our training. There's the legend for what we're looking at there. Um, here's what that looks like when we apply it to Alabama. You can see the MLRAs in the background and then the different counties where we've selected to put our training data. Uh, it's about 50,000 points for the two states combined. And we work closely, um, Jerry Quinn, myself, we also have two other team members on this project. One of them's the GIS specialist in Alabama, the other one's in Georgia. So we talk with them very closely, figure out, okay, how far can I take my training? Which counties are good for training, which ones aren't? And that's how we come up with this. So for example, we'll train Geneva County here and then use that training data to map this block. And that's how we've kind of broken this from a big problem into lots of little smaller problems. Uh, here's what it looks like in South Carolina. That's one of the states we're moving into next. Something interesting about South Carolina, we just got the 2019 imagery 
and it's flown at 60 centimeter resolution, which makes this much more complicated. Um, as we found out last week, it's pretty easy to break your computer. R needs a lot of memory to do this, especially for CLHS, so something to be aware of. Um, we take those MLRAs, break them into mapping regions, and then our training counties. Each one of these squares represents a quarter quad where we're going to go in with CLHS and put down 100 points for training. So once we've generated our points, we go in and label them. So we look at each point and compare it against the NAEP imagery and assign it to a land cover class, forest, water, cropland, etc. We've built an online web app to sort of help crowdsource this. We haven't turned it loose to the public, but we've got about a dozen people in our department who work on this, sort of trained image analysts. Our first release was in May, and we had probably around a dozen people working on it. We had 50,000 points from Alabama and Georgia. And when everyone's up and running, we can do about 10,000 points a week. Um, so I'm going to try and show you guys this real quick if it cooperates. Here's what it looks like from, uh, I think this is a county in Georgia. But let's see if we can bring it up. OK, here we are in Idaho. This is Franklin County, uh, right, right north of us, near Bear Lake there. So I think for Franklin County, there's about 5,000 points. Um, in our web app, we've got a couple options here for imagery. This is the true color image. There's also something called CIR, where you use that um, near infrared band. Super useful for picking out water and sparse vegetation. So let's go back to our point here. What do we want to call this one? Yeah. <laughs> I'd probably call it shrub or barren. That one's a tricky one, maybe not the best example. Yeah. We've got it. Yeah. We have 10 choices here when we're trying to figure out what these points are. Yeah. So you've got your various, you know, here's an obvious one. Yeah. That point lands on a tree. It's forest. Uh, oh, looks like forest. our coworker Forrest already got to that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, we can jump ahead in the list to find an area where someone hasn't worked, hopefully. Uh, again, forest. This has keyboard shortcuts, so I can type in F, and it'll populate, and then automatically take you to the next point. Grass on that one. Uh, we work closely with the Idaho specialist to come up with our land cover definitions. I call it barren. Okay. <laughs> so you know, we've built in this guidance that goes with it, kind of defines our class definitions, hopefully addresses some of those fence sitters or difficult cases. Um, but this is a great way for us to collect training data. Like I said, we can do about 10,000 points a week. And once we finish a county, we dump those points, and now we have our training data to proceed with the modeling. Okay. So once we get our training data, we'll split them into calibration and validation, um, hold out that validation set for later on when we want to evaluate our mapping. So now let's get into the mapping. Um, this is a great figure. I really like this. It's kind of what we were saying before about how you collect point data, and that's hard. That's labor intensive or time consuming. And then you compare that with your environmental covariates, which are relatively easy to access. Combine them in some predictive model for your map output. Uh, that works for soil mapping the same way it does for land cover mapping. Really, a lot of you know, machine learning applications kind of follow this formula. So for our classification algorithm, we're using random forest. That's nice because it handles categorical data fairly well. Um, ultimately, as we move forward, we'd like to compare some different ones and see how they all stack up, XGBoost, SVM. A lot of the current uh, kind of cutting edge with this is neural network stuff, um, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, sort of the deep learning buzzword. Um, so that's something we'll continue to evaluate moving forward. Um, so without getting into too much detail on the random forest stuff, 
this is an example of what one of the trees in the forest will look like. You've got your different land cover classes down at the bottom and then different break values to determine how to split these out. Um, in the stats class, I teach the stuff on tree-based modeling, so I'd love to talk about this all day too, but we're going to keep moving on. Okay, so once we've trained our model, we can apply that to other images to map land cover at unknown, at you know, new locations. Um, this is a huge step for us. It takes 30 to 45 minutes per quad to apply these models. And that's where we have a strong need for GPU and parallelization, something Greg and Doug and I have been working on a lot recently. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, the output maps are about the 10th the size because they're only four bit, you know, values from zero to 10 as opposed to zero to 255. So it makes it a little smaller, a little easier to store. Um, here's an example of what this stuff looks like. So this is our same sample quad from Alabama. You can see the different land cover classes and the breakdown of their percentages. We'll go back to our little test area up here with the Jesus cows again. The model has a really easy time picking that out, whereas some one in the county might blow through it. You know, here we're picking out the dock in their lake. <laughs> it's not grass. There's a dock in it. Um, so we've applied this to about 85 million acres so far. Uh, we've done Alabama, Georgia, parts of Florida, and a chunk of Idaho here. Um, our next steps are going to be to finish Florida, Idaho and do South Carolina and Washington State. We've also got a project going in Connecticut right now that we'll talk about a little bit more. You know, here in both of these, you can kind of see our mapping regions of how we're breaking these states up. And then these are our training counties where we're gonna drop our points and do the labeling. So here's sort of the before and after. Uh, on the left, you see a NAEP image with a CLU. Um, and then on the right, you've got the NLCD version and the LCAT version. The LCAT one, you know, the spatial resolution jumps out at you. This, this stream here above is kind of stair-stepped and a little bit discontinuous, whereas here you can pick it out pretty easily. Another thing to point out is sort of on this edge where you've got some roads and some structures you know, we can pull those out fairly easily here. And that's the kind of stuff that FSA and our, you know, county level people need to know about. If you have a cornfield and you're getting paid to grow corn and you put up a chicken house, that's something they want to know about. So this is something that Greg and Doug and I have been working on a lot. We are trying to develop a Linux and Docker environment to containerize our studio where we can sort of open this up and paralyze it a little bit more. Um, if anyone here is an expert on that, please come talk to me. <laughs> but, you know, that's the future. We see the need for parallelization here, so we're going to figure out a way to do that. Uh, currently, I bounce around between six or seven laptops. I get all the old laptops at our office and hoard them in a cube. So we're trying to move away from that, and I think this will be sort of the next step there. So once we've done the mapping, we do our evaluation. Um, you know, fairly common stuff here. Confusion matrix, overall accuracy, kappa, stuff like that. Looking in Alabama and Georgia, we're about 80% accurate. Some counties are better, some are worse, but that's something we can live with for now. Um, it's doing its job and can pick out these discrepancies. Generally in remote sensing, 60 to 70% is okay. You know, that's acceptable. Um, 80% is good. I think with the amount of data we're talking about here, I see a limit. I don't think we're going to be able to get too much higher than like 90 or 95%. I just don't see it. But it might. We'll keep working towards it and see where we end up. So here's an example of one of these from uh, Lowndes County, Alabama. You know, and this is kind of where I want to draw your attention to the forest and grassland confusion here. We're getting some errors there. And then we can look at this and think, okay, how can we go about targeting that? You know, if you look at forest and grassland, they're both green. They look fairly similar on an image, except, you know, maybe we can use something like LIDAR. We, we have a project in Connecticut right now 
Connecticut flu statewide LIDAR in 2016. So you can take your bare earth and your first return and come up with a height layer. And if we can add that to this model, we think that'll help us separate forest and grassland. So some other things we're thinking about moving forward. Um, in addition to NDVI, there's lots of other spectral indices out there. There's a water index, there's a built up urban area index. So we're gonna try to incorporate some of those, especially for areas like the Florida Keys where you've got so many different colors of water. I think that'll be helpful down there. Uh, another thing is texture. You can do image texture analysis. There's a great package in R that does it. Um, LiDAR, like I mentioned, another thing we've looked at is image segmentation, where you take a raster image and can look for areas that are you know, similar and contiguous and then draw a polygon around that. Basically turn your raster image into a vectorized image. So we're gonna try and incorporate that and see what it can get us. So that's sort of the overview here of the mapping process, kind of walked through all these different steps. Um, again, going back to the big picture goals here, we're trying to, you know, make better payments. We're trying to save people time. And in order to do that, if we can improve the accuracy of these records, we're going to save people time and money. Um, you know, today I really focused on the sampling and the mapping portion here because that's where we're using our studio the most. This is part of a bigger project where we generate the reports, we have a review process. This is something that's going on right now. Um, Sean started that yesterday. So in this, the blue are our inputs, the red are our outputs. Green is custom tools that we've built for this process. Yellow is the QC steps along the way, and then brown is where we need staff input. So this is a much bigger project. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're doing with the reports without going too far into this. I know this is an R group, but we built it in Python, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if we have a crop polygon, we can overlay that with our land cover map and identify any areas that aren't cropland. We use that to kind of come up with a misclassification percent on a given CLU, and then we can create custom reports, sort and filter them, and try to target it that way as opposed to having a county office employee with 16,000 records to review, we can give them a list of 20 and say, start with these. You know, this is something we think is wrong. So that's the general idea there. Um, that's it. Thank you. You guys have questions? Near infrared? Near infrared? Near. Yeah, so, so it's. The part. I'm an astronomer by background, and I actually worked in the near infrared, so I was like, oh, lovely. Because of like, the light, I just looked at it too and just packed the red. Like, just like. Yeah, just so red, red cuts off around 700. Near infrared is kind of 700 to 800. As you move further out into longer wavelengths, there's short wave infrared and thermal infrared. That's like the. Uh, night vision goggles where you see people's body heat, that's the thermal infrared. So that's one of the trade-offs with satellite imagery because Landsat, for example, has much more stuff out in the deeper parts of the spectrum, whereas most aerial photography is gonna be kind of visible in near infrared. Yeah. Does ultraviolet give anything? There's some, I mean, it helps with water. Well, especially with the kind of shortwave infrared, it's really good at like desert landscapes. You can pick out different minerals on the surface. And there's band ratios, just like we use for vegetation. There's ones that target iron or carbonates or whatever minerals. Yeah, good question.
So ArcMap has a lot of classification stuff built into it, um, especially the latest release of Arc Pro. They've got some tree-based modeling that's built into it. Um, unfortunately for us, and I don't know if this is the case for everyone, but for government computers, we're very limited on what we can and can't do as far as installing stuff and how it's all set up. Um, as much as you can do out of it, the better off you're going to be. <laughs> they let us, um, you know, we can, we can customize it only to a certain limit. And I think that's where R works a lot better. It's not um, this huge sort of bloated package like ArcGIS is. ArcGIS tries to do a little bit of everything and it's this massive package, whereas R, you can load libraries to do certain things and it kind of runs with less overhead. So I think that's the motivation to kind of move in that direction. Yeah. For, for the record, if anybody ever gives a talk, nobody ever apologize for using both R and Python. I mean, come on, everybody <laughs> in Well, and we're not. We're not really doing them in combination. We kind of run certain things in R and then other things in Python. So we're not looking. I think it's reticulate that kind of imports between the two. We're not doing a lot of that. We kind of run them as sort of standalone process steps. You also mentioned earlier that in some cases it would fall down due to memory demands. Yes. So running CLHS on a 60 centimeter image, you need 32 to 40 gigs of RAM to do it. Um, it takes two and a half, three times as long. And we had a couple machines that wouldn't run it. Um, Greg threw some more memory in there for me and we got it running. <laughs> so now it's working. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a concern, especially with the trend in imagery is to move to finer and finer resolution. Um, you know, they're talking about five centimeter imagery and it makes me kind of cringe thinking about having to process that. You know, it looks great, but don't work with it. <laughs> I have a question about that aspect. Um, I found it really interesting that you, uh, I, I guess I've never really thought about, like that's just the reality of the way of real life, right? That you had to, that you, that you find you have to build these chunks of, um, of regions, and then this is gonna be what we train make our, train, our human label training data here, we'll apply it here for these quite small regions of the country, right? And then, and then you have, and then you like build models. And then is the, is like the final, you know, tree-based model like random forest, is that something that's more global or is again that applied per chunk? That's a great question and it's something we've been looking at. Um, again, running up against memory constraints, if we try to run one random forest model with 50,000 points, it chokes. It can't do that on our machines. Um, you know, having the smaller modeling domains helps break it up. One of the test cases we've done, and I think I have an image of this. Okay, yeah, this one. So we looked at this county, Crenshaw County, and we put in another set of points there, and we combined, you know, if we use these three counties to map Crenshaw, yeah. is it better? Is it? Not really. It's not. No. We kind of hit the wall there. And that was something that, you know, we're thinking about that from the other end of the spectrum, too. We picked 100 as a random number. Yeah. You know, if we, if we could get away with 60, we'll be able to move that much quicker. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I, that's just very interesting. Well, that's where the MLRAs come in because they've kind of pre stratified areas with similar land cover yeah. for us. Yeah. So we use those. And it's great. When we started down here, I was talking to our guy in Alabama and I go, How far north can I take this? Can I do this county? Yeah. yeah. Can I do that county? No. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. And it kind of matches what we saw with the MLRA map. Yeah. So that was nice. Yeah.
writing for, sharing results for? Um, is it often like um, people who have similar technical backgrounds to you? Or are you most often writing for someone to you, you're like really having to explain what you are doing? So I was wondering that as you gave this talk. That's a great question. Um, part of the FPAC structure, we have these three or four different agencies. Um, APFO is in the process of getting reorganized again into something called FPAC Geo, which is basically combining the geospatial people from all of those agencies under one house. Um, our sort of mission is sort of to be the enterprise platform for geospatial. So our customer is these agencies, the farm service workers in counties across the country, you know, NRCS, RMA, all those people who use these products, you know, they're, they're our customer base.